Let us pray. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. By the power of your Spirit, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 25, starting with verse 31. Let us listen together for God's word to us. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So starting with Easter Sunday, we have been focusing on the subject of hope. And in the first week, we talked about Easter hope, a hope that is honest about death, but is not dimmed by the power of death. And we talked about hope as an anchor for the soul, hope that is not just one hope among so many others that we might choose from, but instead is the ground upon which we stand. It is hope itself that stabilizes us. And then last week we talked about God's hope for the world, and that because God has hope for the world, we too have hope for the world, and we join God in that work of making all things new. Now it was slightly uh, imperceptible, but we took a turn last week. The first two weeks we talked about hope as something that belongs in here or up here. We talked about Uh, hopes that we have, things that we imagine, dreams that we might dream, but in all of these things, hope is an act of the individual. But last week, we talked about something a little bit different. We talked about the ways that hope can drive us into the world, that hope can change the way that we live our lives, that hope is something that we embody. And I'm going to double down on that turn that we took today although it may seem counterintuitive to speak of hope as something that changes the way that we live. Hope is, uh, you know, it's, it's focused on things that don't really exist, at least not yet. Our hope is directed to an uncertain future. Hope is about things that are perhaps even unrealistic. And all of these things sound fine about something that exists within our heads or our hearts. We can contemplate new things that don't exist yet. We can reach with our minds toward the uncertainty of the future and think about the way we would like things to be. We can even imagine almost anything, no matter how unrealistic. But these particular characteristics of hope don't necessarily lend themselves to action. So to try to get at that connection, the connection between hope 
and the way that we act, let's consider Jesus for a moment. In particular, His ministry. The things that He did as He traveled throughout Judea. When He started His ministry, He gathered around Him disciples. Twelve disciples, a significant number, because it was His goal, His purpose, to rebuild the people of Israel, to restore them to covenant faithfulness, to reconstitute God's people. And when He did this, He didn't pick the, the people of power and privilege and influence. He didn't even pick people who were well-educated in Torah. He chose fishermen and other everyday folks, the kind of people that are ignored and taken for granted by people who are in power. And it is with these people that Jesus began His ministry. Jesus tells a couple parables along the way, parables of a feast or a, or a banquet thrown by a king. And the people who are gathered around this table, which is meant to be a vision of the kingdom of God, the people who are gathered around this table are the riffraff. They've been dragged in off the streets to share in this great feast. So it's no surprise that when Jesus has meals that are shared with us in the Gospel stories, very often the people He's having table fellowship with are tax collectors and sinners. Unsavory folks. Impolite company. And in those very meals, giving us a taste of that banquet that He speaks of in the parable. A taste of of what the kingdom of God might look like. Everywhere Jesus goes, as He travels around, people find themselves healed. The blind begin to see. The lame begin to walk and run and jump. The lepers are cleansed and welcomed back into the embrace of society. These are crazy outlandish things. These are the wildest imaginings of what heaven might one day be like when all of our wounds are healed and people saw these things happening in Jesus. He traveled around first century Palestine. And then when push comes to shove, and Jesus finds Himself in confrontation with the authorities, religious authorities, political authorities, Jesus refuses to try to beat the world at its own game. He refuses to adopt the tools of human power. Even to achieve a divine end, Jesus rejects the possibility, utterly rejects the possibility of violence, even if it costs him his own life. Which, of course, it does. And those who are following Jesus through these months and years, those who are watching him do these things, they are seeing something that is as if it's from another world. They are watching things that don't belong in this reality, that don't belong in this existence. They are seeing things that belong to the kingdom of God. When we take all these things together, the, the nature of the disciples that Jesus chose, the nature of His table fellowship, the healings that happened around Him, and His refusal to use the tools of violence, we see in all of these things the essential character of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God finding expression in the life of Jesus. Jesus is bearing witness to something in His life, in His actions, something that doesn't exist. Right? Or not yet. Something that's still far off in the future, or it's supposed to be. Something that is fundamentally unrealistic. And we have a word for that. Impossible. This is what people saw happening in Jesus. Jesus embodied the kingdom of God. Jesus embodied this future hope. We might say, as Jesus made this hope real in His life, that Jesus lived into the kingdom of God. And we who wish to follow Jesus have a similar task before us. To live into the kingdom of God. To live into our future hope. To make our hope real in our living. In our actions. And when our hope is present in the way that we live, in the way that we act, then what we hope for starts to flicker into existence. It, it becomes real momentarily. This great hope, this future hope of the kingdom of God suddenly becomes real as our hope is embodied in our lives. Walter Benjamin was a German-Jewish philosopher in the early 20th century. 
And being a German Jew at that time, he was forced to flee Germany in order to preserve his life. And in 1933, he fled to France. And there in France, he moved around a bit, continued his work of writing. Uh, but France, as you probably know, also was a place very unsafe for Jews as Hitler's influence spread throughout Europe. So in 1940, Benjamin decided to flee to Spain. And as he was uh, at the border of Spain and France, I'm not sure what happened, but something happened, and he feared that he was certain to be captured. And so in 1940, he took his own life. That was the same year that he wrote one of his most well-known essays that has to do with the subject of history. Now, most of his writing wasn't really recognized at the time, but after his death, it became more influential, more widely read. When it comes to Jewish contemplation of the past, of history, and the future, very often the notion of a Messiah factors in in important ways, and that shouldn't come to us as a surprise. Though sometimes Christians oversimplify the role of the Messiah in the Jewish worldview, we might say that Christians found their Messiah and, and Jews either don't believe in Jesus or they are still waiting for theirs. But for Jews, it's much more nuanced. It's a much richer sort of of uh, a worldview that centers around the idea of a Messiah. And for many, it's much more metaphorical. Waiting for a Messiah is waiting for a hoped-for world, a new reality, a new world, a world uh, in which the injustices of this life are, are over, overturned, are undone. A world, to borrow a, a, a word from the Hebrew Scriptures, a world that is characterized by shalom. But for obvious reasons, imagining a hopeful future was not easy for someone like Walter Benjamin. And in this last essay that he wrote in the year of his death, when he talked about history, he rejected the idea that history inevitably progresses, that things just always get better. This was a very common idea in the first half of the 20th century. There had been so much technological and scientific progress, it was hard for people to ignore the fact that things seemed like they just kept getting better. But Benjamin had seen the world differently. He had experienced the world differently. And this is what he says about history. He says, history is one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage. So how does someone with such a dim view of history, think about the role of the Messiah, the one who is to come, the one who is to improve the world, transform the world. Well, he doesn't think about it in the way we might expect. Had I lived through what Benjamin lived through, in my mind, the Messiah would come to judge the evildoers, to fix this broken world with some kind of dramatic intervention to completely uproot the evil that is so deeply entrenched in human existence. That's what I would expect of the Messiah. But not Benjamin. Benjamin believes that we, in the present, that we occupy the messianic position. What he means is that we are not the ones who are expecting someone. We, instead, are the ones that others have been expecting to come. Our task is what he calls the messianic task. Our task is to look upon the ruins of history, to see the incalculable suffering and loss, and to do what we can to redeem it. To do what we can to make certain that the dead have not died in vain. To remember and to restore the immeasurable value of every human life, even the smallest and most insignificant. Our task is to be the Messiah. Now, Benjamin in his life is so completely occupied with the suffering of the past and the evils of the present that he despairs for the future. Ultimately, it's a worldview with very little, if any, room for hope. But we can hardly blame him. Nevertheless, it is a daring idea to suggest that others' hopes are hanging on us. 
Now, we don't need to go so far as to calling ourselves the Messiah to grasp the gravity of that idea, to comprehend the profound impact such an idea could have on how we live. When it comes to hope, we often talk about it as something that I possess, my hopes, my dreams, the things I reach for, the things I want or hope to see around me in the world. But when our hopes are present in our living, then the things that we hope for, they they become real. They flicker into existence. They become momentarily real. We're not talking about my life transforming the world. We're talking about my life possibly making these great hopes, the great hope of the kingdom of God becoming, just for a flicker of a moment, becoming real. And in that moment, something amazing happens. Something that goes far beyond me or what hopes I may have for my life or for this world. And that brings us finally to this passage from Matthew's Gospel. The story of the sheep and the goats, of the last judgment. Now this story ends with eternal reward and eternal punishment, which has led us for a long time to believe that that's what this story ultimately is about. But that is not what this story is about. This story is about what happens when we feed the hungry. It's about what happens when we give water to the thirsty, when we welcome the stranger, when we clothe the naked, when we care for the sick, when we visit the imprisoned. It's a story about what happens when we live into the kingdom of God. When we live into our future hope. And we let that hope become present, become real in the way that we live. And what happens when we do this is we find God. We find God. We enter into the place where God is, which is, of course, the lives of others. We who wish to follow Jesus in this way, by embodying this kingdom, we fulfill the calling that is placed on all disciples. And it is simply to do as Jesus did. To do everything in our power, in our living, to make the kingdom real. George Dewey Carter was a professor at Louisville Theological Seminary, and he once spoke these words in a sermon. These words are now on a plaque on the outside of the seminary chapel. He said this, it is not enough to profess. We have to practice. It is not enough to talk. We have to do. It is not enough to promise. We have to embody The promise, it is not enough to say, ain't it awful? We have to get close enough to get hurt. As we live lives that are shaped by our hope, in those flickering moments, when through our imperfect efforts, the kingdom of God comes alive, when we embody the promise, when we get close enough to get hurt, Here is the amazing thing that happens. We become hope to others. We are no longer the ones who are waiting. We become the ones that others have been waiting for. We are no longer so concerned with the final fulfillment of our hopes because we find ourselves participating in the fulfillment of the hopes of others. And the real beauty of this is that we don't even realize we're doing it. And if someone were to point it out to us, we would say, when, Lord? When did we see you in need and help you? When did we fulfill others' hopes? And how could we possibly be the fulfillment to other people's hopes? When we ourselves become so consumed with our hope for God's kingdom, for the world made right, for shalom. It changes who we are. It changes what we do. It changes how we live. And the kingdom of God becomes real, even if just for a moment. We live into our hope. 
and we become hope's fulfillment for others. Let us pray. God, fill us with your hope. Hope for the kingdom. Hope for shalom, for the world as you intend it to be. And may that hope be so all-consuming that we have no choice but to allow our lives to be shaped around it. To allow our lives to be transformed by it. To allow our, our lives to be evidence of it in the lives of others. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.